Um, glad, that, glad that you're with us, glad that you are joining us online, glad that all of this is coming together and you're here and we're here and the Spirit of God is here and we are thankful. We're going to do something a little bit different. You're going to hear from me, you're going to hear a little bit from uh, Joel and uh, someone else is going to share a little bit um, here in a few minutes. Heather's going to come up in a, in a few minutes and share a little bit about kind of some of what God is doing in their lives, with their lives in and around Crossway and stuff like that. And we want to celebrate today. But, but we're finishing our series called Status Quo, and we've been looking through, you know, we have our mission statement, helping people find, follow, be transformed by Jesus. How do we do that? How do we, we move and do that and be a part of that? And we felt like there are three, excuse me, four Four gears that help us move in that direction. Four gears that, that move us to help people find, follow, and be transformed by Jesus. And so, so those gears, we've been looking at them each week, and, and we've talked about love, and we've talked about uh, giving, and we've talked about growing, and this week we're talking about going. But I realized something, because something happens, and Luke's going to help me. He's going to throw a slide up. If we take one of these words away, it's hard for us as people to find, follow, and be transformed by Jesus. So if we take this, this word love away, I think that's the first one, right? None of those other three gears can move. We can't really be a person that, that gives what God has for us. We really can't be a person that, that's growing deeper than, with God. We really can't be a person that's going where God is asking us to go and doing what God is asking us to do because we first have to have not only our love for God but our love for others. The, that love drives us to do something. And the same thing happens, like if you take out the word grow, I think that's the next one. If you take out this idea of grow, like, like we stop growing deeper, not only in our relationship with God, than our relationship with others, it stops the process. It, it, you could be a person that gives, but, but the world is not hearing about Jesus. People aren't coming to know about Jesus because we have to engage that. And the same thing, if you're a person that, that stops giving, whether it's your talents and all the stuff that God has given you, I think that's the next one, give. If you take that gear out, Nothing moves and works. If we're going to be people that find, help others find Jesus, to help others follow Jesus, decide to, to, to live their life for Jesus, to have others that are, that are being transformed by Jesus, we have to engear, engage all four of these gears. And that's what we've been doing. But it's so easy to just get caught in the status quo to just get caught doing the motions, to just get caught in the same routines over and over and over and over again. It's easy. And maybe those routines have changed. It's interesting, pre-me, um, uh, pre-COVID, pre-all of this stuff, um, I wouldn't consider myself to be a morning person. Like, I'm not. I hated getting up in the morning. Now, you wanted someone to stay up late with you at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, engage the, the night like I was your person. But when it came to getting up in the morning, I struggled. And so to get here at the office at 9 when it opened, I was here pretty good at 9, and like I, but I, I couldn't function very well. It's interesting how that was my status. That was the day-to-day -day grind. I'd stay up late get up late. <laughs> but it's interesting because something shifted in, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of me being sick. Now, like by 1030, like I'm asleep every night. And by seven, it, my, my, I wake up and I know some of you get up way earlier than that and I'm not here to compete. But for me, seven o'clock is really, really early. But that's the new status quo for me. But see, my, my point is this, that, that we can get stuck in just the same routines, the same status quo. And I've been in church long enough, and I've seen churches long enough that as churches, we sometimes get stuck just in the same routine, the same status quo. And what we want to do is break through so that God can do something amazing. Our goal was to help people find, follow, be transformed, and we do that by loving God and others, by giving out of what God has entrusted to us, by growing in our relationship with God and others, and going back into the world for, so that they can find who Jesus is. The bottom line, what I want you to walk away from today is this, that for us to accomplish our mission, we must first go. We must first go. Paul is writing a church in Roman. Roman, not Romans, not, he wasn't, and it's just Rome, yeah, he was writing a church in Rome, just one, just one Rome, so, 
Glad you guys are up here to help me today. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's so great. Awesome. Don't worry about coming in tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> um, Barry, I just freed up some money in the budget. <clears throat> so, no, uh, I, Paul was writing this church in, in Rome, and he was writing these, these, these people because they were, they were struggling a little bit and going, and they had gotten so kind of complacent, so in their routines that they weren't going. And he makes this statement to them, and it's on the screen. You can read along with me, and it says this, how then can they call on him, call on Jesus, they have not believed in? How can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher. How can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, but not all obey the gospel. For Israel says, God, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. He's saying to the church, how are people gonna know about Jesus? Unless the church steps out and goes, unless the church is willing to share the gospel, unless the church is willing to go and and illuminate Jesus where he already is. We learn in in Ephesians that, that, that Jesus is already everywhere. There's no place Jesus isn't. Whether it's the darkest darks that we can think of, there's no place Jesus isn't. But it's us as Christ following believers, job to bring out Jesus wherever you are. Some of us are called to stand up here and preach. Some of us would have never dreamed they would stand up here and preach. Um, Some of us ran from our calling, but some of us are called to be teachers and anchors and financial people and doctors and, and all kinds of other stuff. And our job is to raise Jesus, bring him to light, wherever we are. It's kind of interesting because over the last few years, um, God's been doing some amazing things, not only in in my life and and stuff, and even though some of those times have been hard, um, he's still carrying me through that, but I have wanted you guys to hear a little bit of what God is doing in some of our other staff's life, and so they're going to take a few quick moments here and share, so Susan, you're up first. Like Tony just said, I never in a million years ever thought I'd be standing on a platform speaking. Um, And I have been a part of Crossway literally since I was in the womb. Those of you who don't know me, I've probably said it before, I've been here forever. Um, You know, and I've served in all sorts of ministries, children's and nursery and whatever there was back in the day and whatever there is now. I just um, loved being part of ministry, loved being part of a church body, loved loving other people and making them feel welcome here. Um, And over the years, those abilities, they grow and they change. But I didn't think that it would lead me to more than singing on a Sunday, holding a baby in a nursery, or maybe teaching some kids about Jesus downstairs. But God had other plans. And it was around 2014 that I happened to be working at the church a little bit part-time, and I had to oversee some of the Sunday children's programming when God called me into ministry. Um, I was downstairs. I was working on a bulletin board. And it was if God audibly said to me, for such a time as this, I'm calling you into ministry. And I think I said, what you talking about, Willis? And probably (laughs) looked around like, you can't be talking to me. And then after a conversation with the pastor at the time, after some prayer between me and God and some talking to Kurt, I decided that this is what I need to do because I need to be obedient. Even though I was completely out of my element and surprised that God would even use me But I started classes uh, for ministerial licensing just a couple of weeks later. Um, But there came a point a couple of years down the road that I needed to step away from pursuing uh, the licensing. I stepped out of working here at the church. There was just some things that were troubling my spirit. And that happens in churches. There's things sometimes we're just uncomfortable with, and that can happen. So it was important that I wasn't here, that, that I stepped out of those roles. I still attended, but I stepped out of those positions just so that I could have my head and my heart where God needed it to be. Fast forward to March 2020 when Pastor Tony hired me to oversee um, the children's ministry and also take on some of those secretarial duties. 
Uh, my first official day was March 1st. It was a Sunday. I believe we left for the Exponential Conference in Orlando the next day, my first ever work trip. Feeling pretty fancy. And then we came home on a Thursday, and one week later, the world ended. Um, I was devastated. Uh, I came back from this amazing conference. I was so excited to jump in, pumped up for, like, what God had for this children's ministry and what God was going to do, and, and that was it. And, I mean, I've said it before. I am a people person. I need to be with people. I need to touch you, see you, not look at you through a screen. I need to be with you. I need to make you feel welcomed and be in my home and, like, I, that's just what that's just how God designed me. So not being with people was heartbreaking. Not being able to meet in person was um, lots of days of tears. Uh, and navigating the shutdowns, both personally with my whole family home trying to do online learning and us working, and navigating the pandemic with the staff as my first official year in ministry was super difficult. But as a staff, we continued to move forward the best that we could and just continue to seek God and what he had for our church. Um, so soon after coming uh, on staff in 2020, I began taking those classes towards licensing again because that voice was always there telling me, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Despite all the craziness and despite all the challenges, you need to be obedient. So for years, I have thought God has called me to children's ministry. But what I know now is God has just called me to be obedient to wherever he would lead me. And it's been made more clear over this past year and a half um, and trying to do church during a pandemic that he has designed me and wants me to connect people, to connect people to each other and connect people to him. And the question that's been on my mind for months has been, how do I love people and how do I love them well and with intention? Because everyone wants to belong. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to feel included because when people start to feel those things and start to feel like they are a part of something bigger than themselves, it's transformative and it's catching. And I think that's evidenced by what's happening here. People stepping up to serve, people outside on Sunday mornings. And it's not about the eating the pancakes or eating the food. It's about the connection and seeing Jesus in each other. And that's what God has done in my life. He's transformed my life. And I continue to grow and seek after him. And I want everyone to have the opportunity to experience that. I believe God that um, has gifted me and given me a desire to help other people discover the purpose and calling that he has for their life. And while I may not know exactly what that looks like and how that's going to play out, I just need to keep saying yes to the opportunities that God gives me so that I can help others find, follow, and be transformed by him. At this time, I'm going to invite up Heather North. Many of you guys know Heather. She's been part of the church for a long time. Um, and she's been our worship leader here, our volunteer worship leader. But we consider her staff, and uh, we're just asking her to share her heart this morning. So, Heather. Um, I actually didn't even think I was going to be able to be here this morning, but uh, God had other plans. <laughs> My in-laws are supposed to have their 50th wedding anniversary party, and then COVID strikes again, and so that was canceled, and here I am. So I didn't really have a lot of time to actually prepare this, but um, God's been working in my life as well. And an uh, interesting thing that he uh, has provided for us is that I actually asked to step back as worship director from Crossway just a few weeks ago. And uh, God's really been working in my heart and giving me um, a desire to reach out to those who don't know him. And... It wasn't anything bad of why I'm stepping back, and I do still intend to serve and to be here and lead worship on Sunday mornings. Um, but God really has put on my heart, um, both my kids play travel ice hockey. So if you don't know anything about travel ice hockey, basically that is my life, pretty much. <laughs> and I was struggling for a couple of years with how, to, how do I balance that? How I'm at the hockey rink like all of the time, it feels like, or I'm driving somebody to hockey or waiting for them to get changed after hockey. And um, that was somewhat overwhelming with how do I balance that and preparing for worship and working and my house and all of those things. And um, at the beginning of the year, Pastor Tony asked us as a staff to come up with a, a word for the year. And my word was connect. And at that point in time, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I just felt that that was what God was speaking to me, and um, over the past couple of months, what I've discovered is that 
it really means for me to connect with other people and to connect them to Christ. And so my perspective has changed, and it's really been working over the past more than a year um, for this. But my heart has really changed, and how it's changed is that I realize that they're, my hockey family, they don't know Jesus, and they're hurting, and they have needs, and they need to be encouraged, and they need to be loved, and they need to be wanted. And I, I was spending all my time at the hockey rink anyway, and God just said to me, go, be me. Be my hands and feet to these people that are around you and that I have placed you with. And it really brings me back to this. Each of us is uniquely designed to be connected with the people we're connected with at any given time, whether that be your work people or your neighbors. But you might be the only Jesus that they ever see. And so you have to take that into all into perspective. So for me, it was not stop. I would, for me, it was about a perspective shift. So instead of looking at my transporting my kid to hockey and sitting there at the rink and trying to figure out how to be productive in that time, it now has shifted more to who's here tonight that at this rink? This, who, what other mom or dad needs somebody to come over and to talk to them or find out what's going in their, on in their life or help them walk through a struggle? And what God has really provided for me is opportunities to share my faith with other moms. And some of these relationships I've had since my son was in Mites, which is a couple of years ago now. Um, so some of those relationships God was really working in even back then. And so I've asked for more time to be able to devote to connecting with these other families so that I can connect them to Christ. Because I realized these people aren't necessarily going to come to church. They have hockey. <laughs> and so... Um, but Jesus is everywhere, and I can bring church to them. And so by freeing myself up with some of the responsibilities of having to make sure that all the positions are filled and scheduling and planning and all of that, it allows me the opportunity to freely minister to those that need to be ministered to and to take that hour that my kid has to be there before the game and use that time to connect people, connect with people and connect them to Christ. So I have a mini mission field of the hockey arena and I would challenge all of you. I bet if you think about it, you also have a mini mission field that God has equipped you to do the same type of thing. And if you're not sure what that is, just ask yourself, where are you spending the majority of your time? And who are you encountering in the majority of your time? And that's who God wants you to speak to and minister to. So I encourage all of you to do the same. You guys just give it up for Heather. Heather, Heather is doing what, as a church, we've been wanting to happen. We've wanted to see people go. Because as our bottom line says today, Luke, can you put the bottom line back up for me? You know, you know it, says, it says that for us to accomplish our mission, we must go. And Heather, you are doing that. You are going. And we can't wait to see how God moves in your life and through the hockey family. So thank you for being obedient. We appreciate that. That's awesome. We can church. Amen. Let's celebrate that. You know, I've been asked to come and share my heart now and what God has been doing um, in my life over the past few years. And um, I want to start going all the way back when I first came here. Um, I want to say it was three-ish years ago, three, I don't know. I don't know. Time just runs together. You know what I'm saying? And so it was about three-ish years ago that uh, I was hired here as our next-gen pastor. And, and at that time, next-gen pastor, I oversaw our kids and our youth ministry. And I loved every second of that. I came in here, uh, my previous position at my other church was I oversaw our elementary kids' ministry. And so I had a lot of kids' ministry experience. That's what I was hired for. But God had been shifting and working in my life in such a way that I started to fall in love with the youth ministry and what God was doing in our youth ministry. And then throughout my time here, about a year and a half in, Pastor Tony started to notice something in me. He started to see more of my gifts, and because of that, um, we went through this transition. And that uh, transition moved me into the role I'm currently in, which is executive pastor. And what that means is I get more input into our mission, our vision, and, and the steps that we use to implement that stuff. I see I oversee some of the operational items that we do as a church, but what it mainly did was it allowed me to be up here on a Sunday morning 
so that I could walk into the gifting of teaching that I have. And it allowed me to speak more on a Sunday. And uh, a lot of you probably don't know this, but when I originally came here, speaking, standing on a stage was the thing that I was the most afraid of. I didn't like it. I don't still to this day really like it. Y'all are very scary and intimidating. Even those of you watching online, I see you. And so it's very sometimes intimidating, and uh, it's been tough for me, but throughout my time, I've realized that this is a gifting that God has given me, and I need to start to walk in obedience to it. And so that's what I've been trying to do. And uh, now I really love speaking. I love being able to, to be here and teach. I'm still very much afraid. I'm still very much scared. But I love not only what God can do through my messages, but I love what God does in me, myself, when those messages happen. And so God and I have developed this incredible relationship because of this gift. And it's been powerful for me. And what's been interesting is the more that I've started to look at my life and my, entire, my entirety of, of years in ministry, something has become evidently clear, and it's I've never wanted to be a lead pastor, and I've never wanted to have all of the responsibility on my shoulders. Now, a lot of the reason is because my brother is a lead pastor, and I saw the stress. I saw the weight that he carried and what he walked around with, and I knew, I was like, man, God... I can be on staff as a pastor, but bro, that ain't going to happen. Like, I don't want that stress. I don't, I don't want any of that um, responsibility on my shoulders. But what's happened is God has started to change something in me. And I want you to know I'm not leaving the church. I'm just going to say that right now. I'm not leaving. Kids, don't be afraid. Students, I'm not leaving. But what happened is we uh, went to Exponential, as Susan said, and what was interesting is I actually went and I attended one of the breakouts there, and it was how to plant a church. It was how do, how do you plant a church, and I went with the intention of giving all of my notes to Sean and Chrissy because they weren't able to attend with us, and so I was like, oh, you know, I'll go and I'll learn for them. I'll give them all of my notes. Sean is in the lobby with Samuel right now. I still haven't given you my notes. I'm sorry, bro. Um, but... I went with the intention of giving him my notes, and then fast forward a few years later, actually this past year, we hosted an exponential roundtable here, where we got to sit and we got to learn about what it means for us to be uniquely gifted by God, how we are all made for more. And part of that exponential roundtable, I remember I was sitting right about where you guys are, right here, and I remember sitting there with all of our students, and we were having amazing conversations about how God has given us and what God is going to do in and through us. And as I sat there, one of the stories that came on that we heard from was of the Kansas City Underground Church and how God was using them to uniquely, uh, mis- uh, to uniquely minister to the community around them. And what they were doing was all the community focus. And so what is, what is it that our community needs? What is the one thing that we can do to help our community? And so after that day, Andrea and I went home, and we sat outside, and we just started to dream about what it is that God wants to do in and through us to help our community. And on that day, we started to dream of what, it, what would it look like for us to plant a church that would help our community. And in that moment, this was all theoretical, this was all a theory, and, and as we started to talk, we realized that we both know that God has called us to help families, Um, specifically those families of single moms and those children of single moms, because that's where I came from. That's, That's my story, is my mom was a single mom. And we wanted to be a resource for parents in the communities that are around us. What's fitting is shortly after, we found out that our life was going to change, and we're soon to become parents now. And so God has been using this idea of parenting and family to to grow this deeper call in us. And as we started to pray more, we pray together every single night. And as as we started to pray more together, this no longer was a theory. It wasn't theoretical. This call became a reality. And so I want you to know that we have begun the process of what it looks like to plant a church or a campus from right here at Crossway. 
And so what does that mean? Well, it takes a lot of time. It first started with I had to take an assessment, which I went through. I went through an assessment. And then uh, after going through this assessment, I called a guy named Jesse Pratt, who's been working with Sean and Chrissy, and he uh, oversees all the Wesleyan multiplication stuff, and he's working with us. And so I called Jesse and told him, like, what's been going on in my life? I said, Jesse, it's been really weird. I was sitting at a coffee shop the other day, and I started to look around, and I started to dream of what it would look like to have a Bible study in this coffee shop. I started to to look at the families that were in here and noticed that they were all young families, which were about to be, that there there were parents with babies. There were parents with, with like, toddlers all around them. And and I started to realize that God was stirring something in me to say, Joel, this, this is where you're going to go. This is what I'm doing in you right now. And so now that means that Andrea and I will be traveling in November to go to an assessment center. And that means that we have to sit through three full days of interviews where we just get interviewed over and over and over again to make sure that this is what God is calling us to. And what's been crazy is is I've no, no longer been afraid of the responsibility, but I realize that God has called me to go. And for this mission to happen, I have to be obedient. I have to be obedient. Now, I'm not leaving Crossway. Kids, don't freak out on me over here. I love you guys dearly. Know that I will take care of you and that God hasn't called me yet to completely leave Crossway. We're here and we're completely invested and we're going to stay here until God makes it abundantly clear that it's our time to go. God has been working a lot in my life. But he hasn't only been working in the lives of our staff. He hasn't only been just doing stuff here. God has been doing something with the church entirely. And so Susan's going to come back up. And we're going to take a look at a timeline that we have, um, that we've been through over the past few years. We're going to, like Joel said, we're going to talk about our timeline, where we've been and where God has been carrying us this whole time. But we actually want to have... Um, this in front of you so you can kind of just follow along with us. Some people like it to be right in front of them rather than having to look up here. So I'll just wait a second here. So if everybody wants, you can follow along on the screen or follow along in front of you. But we'll just kind of talk through this timeline and see where we've been and, you know, how God has just been. um, He's had Crossway in his hand this whole time since it's been First Wesley and now it's Crossway and he'll continue to carry us. But we just want to celebrate some of those things and look at some of those things. So um, in February, uh, we had a huddle, which was this little meeting that we had on probably it was probably a Sunday night. And Pastor Tony shared the five year plan that um, God had given him. And then in April, we began to implement that plan, what all those different things looked like. So we started to move in that direction. And while you may not see things like May, June, July, it didn't mean things weren't happening. There just wasn't anything necessarily sticking, sticking out in those times. But we were continuing to move forward in this five-year plan. Um, in November, Pastor Tony got sick. He spent a lot of time in the hospital. It was a very challenging time for him. And um, the church navigated that well because God was with us and God had his hand in everything. Um, Unfortunately, he was able to come back and be with us and um, we're thankful for that. And No, I said fortunately. (laughs) Fortunately. (laughs) I just got fired. (laughs) All right. In December, um, we had this community event, which was uh, hat packs. We packed uh, meals for children in the Hatboro Horsham area who don't always have food um, at lunchtime. And so we were able to partner with them, and the sanctuary was filled with food and filled with people, and we packed these um, lunch bags up for uh, children. In February was a staff change and realignment. Uh, some things needed to change because of the, how the five-year plan was moving forward. And then in March, that's when I came on staff. Um, I think, I don't know if you 
did you move to executive officer four then or yeah um, we had our new mission statement so we our mission statement used to be um, helping people make life work which is it was perfect for the time it was what we needed for the time but really helping people make life work could be anything lots of things make life work and it doesn't necessarily mean Jesus and we wanted our mission statement to reflect where we are going as a church. So the mission statement is helping people find, follow, and be transformed by Jesus. In June, uh, no, I'm sorry, in April, where am I? can't read, I can't see. March 12th uh, was when we had to shut down. That was where I talked about the end of the world. That happened there. Um, so over the summer, I believe that summer, I, we still tried to host a few little connection points and events and some family things outside, which was really great just to be able to keep that in-person connection. Um, in June, we were able to reopen again, and we had our first in-person service um, that we hadn't had for 13 weeks, and it was awesome to just be back in the building with each other. And in July, we um, welcomed the Solidays here as they were going to be planting a church, and we were going to be supporting them in that. And then here comes September where parents were really uncertain about what was going to be happening with their kids. Are they going back to school? Or are they staying at home? How am I going to do this when I'm trying to work? And we really wanted to connect with our community and find a way to help them uh, navigate that really difficult time. And we hosted um, a student program where children were able to come here Monday through Thursday from 7.30 to noon, and we would help them, like just oversee them do their schoolwork. Just say hi to them in the morning and connect with them, and they were able to interact with, of, with other children during that time. And it was really awesome because we had a lot of uh, community families come to that, to that program, and we've still kind of kept some of those connections to this day, which has just been really awesome, and I think we had around 30 to 32 students registered for that program. Um, in October, we hosted our first Trunk or Treat event. It was, again, we were trying to just keep in the community and, and keep engaged with them, and despite it being, um, you know, things were still kind of shut down at the time, a little strange around here, I want to say we probably had over 200 people walk through this parking lot. It was really awesome. And not only were there so many people from the community um, who were able to attend the event, but there was people who we didn't even know who were like a friend of a friend who had their car filled with candy to give out to people. So it was really amazing how God used that event to connect people. Um, in November, we moved to one service, which can seem like a negative, but it's not. Um, when the attendance is a little smaller, it's easier if we're kind of all together. And so we decided at this time, this is what we needed to do, is to move to that one service. Um, we hosted a coat drive and a holiday market. Uh, this was our first ever coat drive. We'd, we've never done something like that. And while that particular day wasn't highly attended, um, we were able to still donate those coats, and they went to um, a Catholic fam um, charity's home, and they gave all those coats out to children who needed them. Um, we had our holiday market, our first ever craft fair. And then on the 29th, we had to shut down again. Some things were going on again, and we decided it would be wise if we just um, met online for a few weeks. And then uh, we wanted to connect over December. Uh, Christmas is a super important event. It's a time where we want to be together as a church family. So we had an outdoor Christmas service, which I actually really loved. It was a really special night to kind of be back with people we maybe haven't seen um, every week, and it was just a really special night to be back together. And while the church was, uh, the doors were physically closed, we were still meeting online, but um, we were able to remodel some of the, of the lobby and some of the classrooms downstairs. We just started working on kind of sprucing things up around here because we knew at some point we were going to be able to be um, able to come back together, and we did that on the 10th uh, when we opened our services in person again. And then in February, we had 12 baptisms and five people become members. So despite things being closed down, despite our children's ministry not looking the way that it necessarily has looked in previous years and church not necessarily looked the way that it's always looked, God was doing things in people's lives, and God was doing things in a lot of children's lives. Uh, many of those baptisms were actually our children and teens, which is just really awesome. In April, we ho hosted our third community egg hunt. This was the third time that we've done that. We weren't able to ha have it off-site, but we actually had it here, and it was a, another great day of just connecting with our community. The more that we can get out there into our community, and they can just know that we love and care about them, 
it's, it's awesome. It's just starting to plant those seeds. You know, we may never see that person again, but they may to this day be thinking about that connection that they had here on that day. In July, we wanted to continue with this idea of connecting people. We don't have um, a large number of people that attend life groups outside of church, so we thought, how can we bring life groups into the building? And that's why we switched to this um, table, so that we can connect with each other on a, on a weekly basis. And then in September, um, which just at the beginning of the month, uh, Sean and Chrissy did move to Fishtown. We helped move them in, and they are on their way to planting this church, and we look forward to continue to being able to support them um, as they navigate this time. Can we just celebrate all that God has done in our church? I think, I know that's a lot of information, but man, 12 12 baptisms, like 12 people taking a next step in their walk with Christ is something we should celebrate, amen? And so church, uh, thank you for that. And and so I just want to bring us back. In April 2019, uh, we rolled out this five-year plan, and we believe that this plan were the steps that we needed to take in order for us to fulfill the mission that God has given us. And so I want to walk you through what the goals of that five-year plan were were. And so the first is year one. In year one, we wanted to have a discipleship track that was built and rolled out. And this discipleship track is one that's interesting. It looks different now. Uh, it's changed a little bit. But what discipleship means is that it's, just, it's us coming alongside of people to helping everyone walk closer to God. It's walking with people to help them deepen their relationship with Christ. And we knew that this is an area that we needed to work on as a church. And so we were intentional about formulating this plan and this track. And and that's what we did. The next is that we wanted to have full ministry buy-in. That means that all of our ministries, all the way from the nursery up until cast your cares, like, like everything was working collectively toward the same goal, which is helping people find, follow, and be transformed by Jesus. We wanted to have everybody working together on target for the same goal. And then the next was we knew that in order for that to happen, we would have to realign some staff positions and we would have to to transition some, some positions in order for that to work. And then in year two, we wanted to have what we call church buy-in, meaning you. We wanted to have you bought into this mission of helping people find, follow, and be being transformed by Jesus. We want us all working for that. And we wanted to see leaders being developed and now released into ministry, meaning that we want to be able to say, whatever you have, whatever God is calling you to, we want to walk alongside of you in that, and we want to help you do those things. Then by year three, we want to see we wanted to see a, a church plant or a church campus happen. We wanted to launch a church from, from Crossway, from right here. And that's looking like Fishtown. Like, that's what we're doing. We're launching a church in Fishtown with Sean and Chrissy. And it's something that's going to be amazing and powerful because people need Jesus. Amen. And in year four, we want to launch a second church, which is looking like it might be Andrea and I, and God's calling us into that. And so that's what we want to move forward with. And then in year five, the end of the five-year plan, we want to see three healthy campuses or church plants, meaning the one here and each of the two plants are healthy. We want it to be debt-free because we believe that debt can hold us back as a church. We want to be properly staffed. And we wanted to have an ongoing discipleship program and a culture of inviting and pointing people to Jesus. That's our goal. We want people to know, we want people to find, we want people to follow and be transformed by him. And so that was our, those are the goals that we have for our church. So two years in, it's interesting because I I, might have shared this last week, I I don't know. or a week before, but I was always at, God, why did you give us this? God, why did you want this for our church? Knowing that we're going to shut down, knowing that life for every human that's been affected by this would drastically be changed. Because in the last year and a half, your lives, whether you admit it or not, have drastically changed. COVID has drastically changed the way that we do almost everything in our lives. 
And I'm like, God, well, this doesn't make any sense. And then we started to celebrate. And, and we talked about this. We were like, how do we, how do we present this? How do we tell this to the church? Because, because sometimes if we say, hey, you know what? We're going to have a Tuesday night meeting. Like, it's great for the six people that show up because life's busy. And so we said, you know what? Let's take a Sunday. Let's celebrate as a church, not only where we've been, not only what God has asked us to do, but what God has accomplished in the last couple years since we started this journey. Where are we? Oh, well, in 2019, you saw that our staff has kind of changed. It's kind of realigned. We, we set up job descriptions for stuff. It was actually funny, and it's probably, but it's, it's your fault. You're the executive pastor. Um, but Susan, the, the other, like, oh, she was like, I don't know if I ever got my job description when I was hired, because she was hired, and then we were like, we just threw it all out the window because we went to a church online and, and stuff like that, and we weren't having kids, we weren't doing stuff, and literally all of our jobs started to, to shift and change because we had to pick up whatever uh, baton, whatever banner that we could pick up as we moved, and so we realized as things had come back, we were like, we should really look at our job descriptions again, and so that's one of the things that we're looking at, how we do that, um, and, and even now how they've changed in this last week, we're, we're kind of putting it together, and who, who's going to do this, and, and what ministries are there? Um, you can see our debt. Our original loan amount was $765,000. At May, when we started this five-year plan, our debt was $699,891,881. This is why I preach and don't do numbers. Um, our current balance is $354,000. Um, we're in negotiations and probably not probably, either by the end of this month or the beginning of next month, we'll be selling our other property. Or actually, our debt will be down to $109,000, which is crazy to think about in the, mats, in the midst of two years, in the midst of COVID and stuff like that, that we've greatly reduced our debt into something that is manageable for us. Yes, we've sold some properties in doing it. Yes, we've done some different things, but there's, there's that. Pre-COVID, we had 11 people in one-on-one -on -one discipleship, five life groups meeting. Post-COVID, we have about five people right now in one-on-one -on -one discipleships. We have three life groups that are running that, uh, that are, are back up. Um, we have Heather and Jeff that God is calling to be a life group that most people wouldn't consider maybe as a life group, but I think is amazing that they're going to do life with people and share Jesus uh, with that. Um, Pre-COVID, or through these last years, we've lost 13 people who are currently serving this is one of the things that has amazed me. We've had 25 people in the last year and a half step up and serve that have never served before. It's crazy to see how God has doing some stuff. Um, some of you guys know Sandy. She shared with me a few weeks ago. We approached her a while back and said, hey, I know God's doing some stirring on your hearts. What would you think about taking over all of our children's? And she was like, that's what God's called me to do. That's what I want to do. And so we're transitioning now, Sandy, and you'll see her picture. And I promised her I wouldn't make her preach, but I think I promised you the same thing. So, eh, whatever. Um, uh, but uh, she's going to start taking over all of our children on, on Sunday and on Wednesday nights. And God is calling her and moving her into this. And it's amazing seeing that happen. Um, Sean and Chrissy are in Fishtown. They're building relationships. They're working. Our, we got to go down on Wednesday and hang out with them for a little bit and just see what God is doing with them. It's amazing seeing that work, that Pastor Joe and Andrea are now preparing to launch a campus of Crossway down the road. We got to keep saying that. Everybody's going to be like, oh, you're leaving? Um, uh, he's following that. Um, it, it's interesting. Susan's one class away from being moved from being a ministerial student to being a licensed minister. And that's, that's exciting. And I say all that, and we've done all this, and we've talked about all of this, because the, the thing is, when God is telling you to go, you have to step to follow that mission that God has. And I don't know what it is for you. We can only share what it's been for us. And it doesn't mean that you're going to get called into ministry and you're going to have to be a preacher someday, but it could mean that. I remember when Jalen and I decided to, to resign where we were comfortable at in North Carolina. And it was coming to the end of 2016, beginning about the new year, and, and we resigned and God went silent on us. 
I was like, God, what do you mean? What do you got for us? I had no idea where he would take us, what he would do with us. But he's brought us here. And the goal is that we have to continue to be obedient. But I know you hear stuff like this, and sometimes you wonder, what's my next step? What's my next thing that that God has for me? What is my next thing that that I'm supposed to do? If I'm supposed to go, what does that mean? It was amazing uh, after um, our board at the beginning of this month, and, and then uh, uh, the individual got to meet with that. Somebody said, you know what, after all these years, I, I know what God's calling me to do. And someone who wants to write cards and send notes and cards uh, out to uh, people who maybe are sick or people that are, that are going through a tough time or may have lost someone, and, and they're kind of finding their identity. And we want to help you guys find your identity. And maybe it's that you go and you step out and you start a life group with a bunch of hockey people in a rink hanging out. We want to help you with that. Maybe it's just getting involved here. Maybe it's doing something more, but there has to be this. So what is your go? We're going to have our worship team come up. We're going to end today with a little time of response. I know some people are people that can absolutely hear something, see something, and be like, yep, I'm in. I know for some of us, we have to think about, pray about, wrestle with God about, um, and, and there's that. But, but on your tables, in the seats, if you're sitting up here, I think there's some floating around on the front. If not, they're right behind. Someone can help you. There's these little cards, and they say something on there. And up here are these jars, these jars that have different words on them. Whether they say life group teachers, or, or maybe you're a handyman. Maybe you love social media. I found out this week that for the first time, like, there's, there's someone that their job is graphic design, and I'm like, how come I never knew this? And I won't call them out, but um, I'm like, there's things that we can do. There's ways that we can give. But Joel was saying this. It's much bigger. We were talking about this this morning, and he was pointing out. It's much bigger than just being a greeter. Because you get to be the first person people see as they walk through these doors. You get to be that smile that maybe someone needs because, look, if we're all honest, there's some rough car rides that get to church. There is. And if you don't believe me, just borrow someone's kids and then try to bring them to church. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and there's a list we can give you of who kids you can, no, I'm just kidding. But it's true, and, and somebody might be someone that's warm and inviting and just to smile and love on them for a moment and talk to them. Someone that maybe you're great at remembering names, remembering faces. Maybe you know God's stirring to do something in our community and they want to start something or you want to be a part of something. You want to do something more. Let us help you figure that out. Maybe you're realizing that life groups are more about just showing up at someone's house, but it's truly, deeply doing life with some people, and that's what you want to do. Maybe in our nursery, it's not about just volunteering for a kid, but maybe every parent that hands over a baby, your ministry in there is just to stop for a moment and pray for that baby and pray for that child. Maybe you are a prayer warrior and our child check-in, that's what you do. And every family that comes through, yes, you get to do a task, but checking them in, you're praying over those families. You see, our go can just be checking a box and filling something out, or it can mean something. And so on there, you see a list of things, whether it's a handyman whether it's being a host. Maybe you're amazing with social media. And God needs you to just be some hope, some encouragement, some truth in the midst of a world where social media is, I believe, flipped upside down. Maybe you're techie. Maybe you can do design. Maybe you can be that first impression for people as they see things. 
I don't know what it is, but I know God has called each of us to go. And for us to accomplish our mission, we have to go. I heard a statement a few weeks ago, and you're going to have to go back a few slides for me. If you're wondering when you're going to fill in this blank. But there's this statement that says this, when you find your why, you find your way. When you find the why behind what you're doing, you find your way. Way before I came, and I know Susan, you guys were, you were here and some others, Crossway lost its why for quite a while. And it struggled and it went down and there was just a few families that were here. And those families found their why for Crossway. And Crossway started to find his way again. And here we are and God has given us a purpose and God has given us a why. We are trying to push that way. But here's what I know too, when you lose your why, You lose your way. In the midst of COVID, I think a lot of people have lost their why. And to accomplish what God wants us to do, to accomplish the mission, it has to be a step forward. As we sing this song, there might be something that has to break in your your life, something that has to move in your life so that the Holy Spirit can lead. It might be one of the decisions you have to make. Heather, I know for you guys, you and Jeff, for 15 years poured your life into the worship up here. And I know you're not leaving, and I know you're not going to stop singing with us and being a part of our team, but I know it's tough to say, I have to give this up so that I can make room for this. And some of us need to make room. We need to ask God to break down things in our life, to change our schedules around so that we can accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. Those notes are on your table. Maybe today you want to fill it out. If you want to fill it out and drop it in one of these things while we stand and sing, please do so. If not, they'll be out in the lobby and for the next few weeks you can can do that. If you have questions about anything we said today, you want to talk to us about anything, we would love to talk to you about that. I would tell you to email us, but usually nobody emails you. Come find us. Talk to us. We want to see and hear about things. Let's sing, and as we sing, why don't you guys respond to what maybe your go is. Father God, lead us in this moment. God, help us to realize that we need you. And God, for our church to continue to help people find, follow, and be transformed by Jesus, God, we realize we have to live and we have to give and we have to grow. God, we have to go. go back to that passage, God, who is going to hear unless somebody goes? How are they going to know about you, Jesus, unless somebody rises up? God, I know this last year, we've seen so much crash and burn, but God, it's time for your church to rise up.